Okay, good afternoon everybody, or welcome back. Uh, before we kick off our final talk for this afternoon, I just wanted to remind those of you who plan on participating tomorrow morning that the workshop starts an hour later. So we are starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow morning. Uh, Jim, if that's not correct, I mean, uh, let me know in the presenter chat. Okay, and so I will have the meeting room, the virtual meeting space open at 9, beginning at 9.30 a.m. Um, generally in the morning, I try to make sure everything is up and working a few minutes before, which is why I don't have it open a little bit earlier. Okay, all right. So our 15-minute break is just about up, and I would like to take a moment now to introduce our final speaker for today, who is Joanna Voinova. She is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Delaware. It is my pleasure to introduce her today. Joanna? Thank you, Jennifer. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, yes, so yes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Jim Macker, for inviting me to present our research today. And uh, so this paper was published uh, in JGR Oceans last year. And we used a number of data sets, including the Giovanni, some, some data from, from Giovanni, which um, I, I will present. And we were trying to get uh, to the, basically, um, to the ecosystem-wide influence of seasonal wind-driven upwelling in and around the Delaware Bay. Um, so I want to acknowledge my co-authors here, Matt Ol Oliver and John Sharp, and as well as some collaborators that help uh, for this research, and also our funding sources. So um, to start, uh, just give you a brief overview, even though some, uh, some of the talks already touched on this subject. So this is um, a global view of the sea surface temperature uh, from Giovanni for one month from between July and August 2010, where uh, you can see um, a change in temperature gradient from colder near the poles to warmer near the equator. But there are also some regions kind of like this near the, the coast of um, California and Peru where we have colder water that hugs the shore. And we can highlight these regions and, and others uh, even in the open ocean and near the coast. Um, and these are upwelling, major upwelling regions. So I'm glad that the previous speaker already uh, mentioned a little bit about upwelling. But here is a um, little cartoon. In the northern hemisphere, if we have wind that blows along the coast, um, and as he mentioned, um, that drives water in the northern hemisphere to be deflected to the right of the wind, which causes deep water to have to come and replace the displaced water. So that's the process of upwelling. And the reason why this is important is not only because it brings, in, in these cases, um, where the shelf is not very uh, broad, it brings water from, from the deep ocean, which is cold, um, up near the surface. And we can see these large temperature changes. But it also, this deep ocean water is often high in nutrients. And so uh, these nutrients generate phytoplankton growth, as we saw from uh, another talk earlier uh, this morning. So. Um, the consequence from this is that um, these regions are very productive. And so, for example, this is a, uh, an image of the chlorophyll distribution from Component Hutchins in 2013, where they've highlighted some of the major upwelling regions uh, near eastern boundary currents, as you can see here. And so uh, you can see the, that Chlorophyll is certainly we can we can track the chlorophyll response, but when these regions are 
um, very persistent, upwelling is very persistent, they also maintain a very rich food web. So they're important economically as well. So when we look at other regions, we can zoom in again using Giovanni. And we can see this, still the, this is the east coast of the United States with temperature change from colder temperature to warmer. And now we can pick up some features, like, for example, the Gulf Stream here. And if we focus on the Mid-Atlantic Bight, which is here from Massachusetts down to North Carolina, uh, this is the region where we have a very broad continental shelf. But I wanted to point out that along the shore here, we have a region of colder water that kind of hugs the shore as well. So let's zoom in. Um, some of the features that I want to point out here is, for example, this is the Chesapeake Bay, for those of you um, who are not very familiar. This is the Delaware Bay. And the Delaware Bay is where we will focus today's, uh, today's research. And as I mentioned, there's this uh, gradient of colder temperature going near the coast. It's very interesting. So what is, does that, is that a, um, does that suggest that there is upwelling, perhaps? Um, so of course, we can also look at the chlorophyll data. Um, and it looks like there is some uh, increase in chlorophyll near the coast. And this is, uh, again, just an image from Giovanni that I extracted for this presentation uh, from Modis Aqua with 4 kilometer resolution. So a really cool way of visualizing uh, data like this. And so, yes, you can say that, for example, there could be some freshwater sources with nutri that deliver nutrients. But mostly, these are in the estuaries, the Delaware Bay and the um, Chesapeake Bay. But in this region in particular here, um, we don't have as many uh, sources of fresh water. So that's probably uh, not the reason why we have this response. And there has been actually a fair amount of effort in along the New Jersey shelf, and these uh, this, these are some only some of the work that has been done in this region. And they have indeed seen that there are, in particular, in the summer, appalling favorable winds, so winds from the southwest, and they drive. Um, there has been uh, surface water measurements that have been to the right of the wind in the summer. And also, they've, we've seen, or they have seen, some biogeochemical response. In the Delaware Bay, primarily the work has been done uh, regarding winds that are short, uh, short term, like two to five days. And there has been um, these uh, work, works here, and along with others, have shown that there is response to wind both upwelling and downwelling favorable winds. So we definitely have an Ekman uh, transport in this region. So we wanted to examine uh, what happens um, if upwelling occurs and how, what, what is the climatology in terms of seasonal changes. So we looked at sea surface temperatures from advanced very high resolution radiometer with one kilometer resolution. We also examined wind patterns to determine the wind stress from NOAA stations and um, to look into where the cold water is coming from. We looked at historical cruise data sets. And then we also used, as I mentioned before, a number of other data sets, uh, historical data and more recent satellite data to determine um, what the effect of upwelling is on the nutrients, primary production, uh, phytoplankton, and zooplankton uh, data sets. And so at the end of the talk, I'll just show you briefly one slide with some of the in situ data to show you what we can see um, with uh, measurement from, from ships. OK. So, um, to give you an idea about what we can see and the type of data that we use, this is uh, on the left, we have an image of an eight-day average sea surface temperature. This is the Delaware Bay. And this is one image in June, where we have sea surface temperature. Um, 
there is not, not much change, as you can see. And if we extract the data along this transect roughly, um, it's shown on the right panel with distance on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis with the mass of the Delaware Bay here at zero. And the mass is right here. So we have um, the distance from inside the bay, about 75 kilometers inside the bay, to all the way 180 kilometers offshore. So Jennifer, if you'd like to play the animation, Thank you. And um, here we have the Delaware Bay with change so that the temperature warms up. But there is a region on the left panel kind of that hugs the shore that is consistently colder than both the bay and the offshore water. And if we take a look at the transect on the um, on the right on the right here, we can see that that region is right around the Del the mouth of Delaware Bay. And so only in September do we have um, the temperature equalizing kind of and getting colder. So we can go back to the presentation. Thank you. OK. So um, to give you a, an graphical representation of the movie I just showed you. Um, this is the sea surface temperature from June through August in 2008 um, is represented as an average on the right panel. So the Delaware Bay, I don't know where my cursor is, but there we go. Uh, the Delaware Bay is here. And we have a change in sea surface temperature from warmer water in the bay to colder water and warmer water offshore. And that goes along this whole region um, that is pictured, so just along the whole coast. And even uh, near the mouth of Delaware Bay, we have even colder water, so almost like a, like a center of cold water. And to, we can get a transect that kind of goes along um, the middle of the bay and then offshore in which we can identify a region of upwelling in white and then a, a, the adjacent bay in gray here and the adjacent shelf water, just as a, as a visualization. As a reference, I've given the bathymetry in the region um, where we have very, very shallow bay and only in the middle of the bay here we have a, a deeper shipping channel. And these black points are the historical uh, stations where the a lab group of John Sharp has taken biogeochemical bio parameters uh, from 1978 to 2003. So we have a very nice data set for what's going on in this region. And we use just these lower points to um, represent some of the parameters that we'll examine further in the talk. The other thing I wanted to point out here are two stations uh, that we, where we collected wind data. These are a NOAA port, a near shore station at Cape May, and then a NOAA buoy 44009, which represents the offshore wind station. And so again, going back to this transit here, um, in the next slide here, we can, if we put uh, the data along the transect, so this time the uh, distance from the bay mouth is on the y-axis, so zero is where the uh, mouth of the Delaware Bay is, and here is inside the bay and here is offshore. Um, if we put all of these transects for one year, so we have time on the x-axis, we can see a change in temperature from colder to warmer and then back colder. So this is just a seasonal change. And in the upwelling region here highlighted, um, we can see that uh, the temperature is consistently colder than both the bay and the offshore water. So we can just do a temperature difference. Um, from the average upwelling region for each time, we can subtract the average bay and adjacent shelf water that are summed together. And so we can get a 
temperature difference between the upwelling region and the adjacent bay water. And that's what's plotted on the bottom plot here. So between May and September, we have consistently the upwelling region colder than both the bay and the shelf water. And with that, as a reference, we have plotted wind stress from the two wind stations that I mentioned. So the blue is the offshore station, which is, has a higher wind, um, wind stress. So uh, we have a little bit of a difference in the magnitude. I just want to point out that this is only a plot of the longshore wind stress component. So we're only looking at the component of the wind stress that would either um, contribute to upwelling or downwelling favorable conditions. So in the summer, when we have a very uh, large negative uh, delta T, we have consistently upwelling favorable winds, which are larger than zero here. OK, so what happens um, over a longer period of time? This is the wind stress plot from 2003 to 2011 where every summer is highlighted with the vertical lines between May and September. So every summer we have appalling favorable winds. And the wind stress is much lower um, in magnitude compared to the rest of the year. And every summer we also have a consistently colder um, upwelling region compared to both the bay and the shelf waters. So we can correlate the two, these two parameters uh, by um, adding all the data, so just um, doing a monthly average over the whole time frame between 2003 and 2011. So each of these points is um, an average of all years for this particular month. And so whereas during most of the year, um, we have not much response in the upwelling index, we have a uh, a significant correlation between the longshore wind stress and delta T in the summer. And so with this, what we were getting here to, um, to say is that we do have a response on a more like a monthly basis between um, the longshore wind stress and delta T. So there is some correlation. To put it in perspective, um, as I mentioned, other studies have looked. Hello. You have been conducting a meeting for a long period of time. If you need to continue meeting, press 1 now. If not, I'll end the meeting. And they from the literature, they have contributed this, these seasonal changes to the shift in um, the seasonal Azores high pressure system to the north and the west. So we are getting kind of the edge of the system in the summer. OK, so the one thing that's missing here that would be very helpful is chlorophyll. And this is where we got from the Giovanni data set. And it was very useful because we were able to obtain eight-day average data for so the same type of treatment as our um, delta T or as our sea surface temperatures. And we also looked at, this is a Modis aqua plot, but we also looked at sea width. And they had the same type of uh, patterns. And the significant part here is that we were expecting to see an increase in chlorophyll in the summer. And instead, we see uh, not only no increase, but also a little bit of a decrease. Only kind of at the end of the season, sometimes we have this increase in chlorophyll. But that's when the upwelling index comes close to 0. So it's a very interesting pattern. And it's a, it's a very different from typical upwelling systems, major upwelling systems that uh, we've seen before. OK, so where does the bottom water come from? To answer this, we looked at um, historical cruise data. And overall, I'm giving this as an example. This is Delaware Bay. Um, there are a number of cruises that overall go between the 
the inside the bay and then kind of cross the shelf like this. And so we have distance on the x-axis, depth on the y. And um, these three cruises are from July 1977, August 1977, and July 1987. They're um, very different time, time frames, but they all show the same pattern in which you have a large temperature gradient here and a dome-shaped feature um, that's kind of situated uh, at the bottom, where the temperature at the bottom is close to 8 um, degrees Celsius. And so this is called the cold pool. It's a feature that occurs um, along the shelf. And it's because um, of spring-summer stratification that isolates the cold winter water at the bottom. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is that here is the upwelling region as defined previously. And this is the map of Delaware Bay. And as you can see, there are bending isotherms here in this region, suggesting that there could be something that um, taps into the cold pool. And we think that this is um, this process of upwelling. So the reason why this is also important is because if we look at historical data, data sets um, from this is a, an average temperature profile from, from these five stations. So this is a representation of what happens with that um, seasonally. We have um, six cruises here, uh, March, uh, April, June, July, um, August, and September. And these were done in 1977. And they were represented, this is data from um, Sharp and Church in 1981. So we have a warming up of the surface waters. But in the, in the bottom water, we see how the temperature remains fairly cold. And so in, that bo in those bottom waters, we have accumulation of nutrients. In this case, this is nitrate plus nitrite. But uh, phosphate shows the same pattern. So what I'm trying to get to here is that the cold pool can be a source of nutrients if um, we can get the cold waters to be upwelled or even mixed with the surface. And I want to mention here that this stratification only occurs seasonally and the accumulation of nutrients. So um, we also did a more recent cruise in 2010. I participated together with Alden Nelson here and the picture. Um, on a cruise that was led by Bob Chant and Chris Summerfield, uh, Bob Chant from Rutgers University, Chris Summerfield from uh, UDEL. And so we saw, uh, we were on the RVQR Sharp pictured here, and we saw a similar pattern um, with temperature. This is, uh, again, distance on the x axis and depth on the y axis. We were going from inside the bay, so this is the adjacent bay region, and then offshore um, all the way, just a little bit offshore of the bay mouth. And so we have a temperature gradient with bending isotherms. This is this time the, the upwelling region um, from the bay side. And I also wanted to show you here the salinity profiles, uh, where we have the influence from the bay. So this is the, the freshwater influence here as a reference. And so we took um, surface and bottom samples along these stations for a number of parameters, including nutrients. And this is the sled that was used for the bottom sampling. Um, we also used a surface pump for the surface sampling. So there are two different samples. So um, to give you a sense of what happens with the nutrients, in the bay, of course, we have um, higher nutrients. And they decrease both the phosphate and the nitrate. And we have surface and bottom in black squares. But whereas nitrate doesn't increase, and in fact, it is below um, the detection limit here in the upwelling region, we have an increase in first the bottom and the surface uh, phosphate. And so the interpretation of this is that uh, the lower bay region and the upwelling region is uh, a nitrogen limiting region. So probably, even though we have nutrients upwelled from the cold pool, we um, probably nitrogen is consumed as soon as it's upwelled, and phosphate is left in excess. So that's what we think is happening. And why this is important is 
because if um, if we put this in perspective of historical other other research uh, done before, for example, this is a nitrogen budget uh, presented by Pennock in his dissertation from 1983, where he identified, for example, this is the standing stock of um, nitrate and ammonium, and he identified sources like flux from downriver, so this would be upstream sources. And then remineralization, well, we have a lot of um, not ammonium that's being recycled from um, remineralization. And then we have um, uh, sinks, like phytoplankton uptake and maybe some flux offshore. offshore. And whereas the, night, the ammonium uh, budget has been accounted for, so we have uh, the influx is here and uh, phytoplankton uptake. Uh, that kind of equalizes the ammonium budget. Nitrate, um, there is a deficit, whereas there is um, some nitrate that comes flux down the river. There is more nitrate being uptaken in uh, the bay that can be accounted by these sources. And so this is where maybe upwelling comes in, and that could potentially account for the missing budget of nitrate. So we don't necessarily have a proof for this, but, but perhaps that's what's going on. OK, so um, to, if we, we can use a number of other parameters to get more ecosystem um, view of what is going on and how upwelling affects this region. And to do this, we use a number of um, historical data sets. And so here in this plot, we have several different time frames. In black is the more recent data, including wind stress from NOAA stations, uh, delta T from AVHRR stations, and then chlorophyll here um, that is uh, from the Giovanni data set. And along with this, we can use some, some of the historical cruise data that was in the bay. Uh, from 1978 to 2003, those are the white points. And we have N to P ratio, uh, aerial primary production, carbon to chlorophyll ratio, and chlorophyll as well. And then finally, we also use some data from the um, National Marine Fishery Survey. Um, it's a data available online. And these are the red dots here. Um, they also represent the data that is shown in, these, in this region in red dots. And we also extracted data from other regions shown here in blue and black, but they showed the same pattern. And so um, this is, um, on the x-axis, we have months. So this, these are the monthly climatologies, um, again, for each, for um, all of these time frames. So it's a, it's a big average, monthly average. But what we can see is that in the summer, when we have upwelling favorable winds, uh, the delta T is consistently um, very low. And with that, we have a low uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, uh, which suggests that this is a nitrogen limited system. However, we have high, high primary production in the summer, which is very curious. And so we could have. Uh, persistent delivery of nutrients from the upwelling that can help maintain this high primary production along with remineralization. So um, we don't see any apparent increase in chlorophyll from uh, both the historical and the Giovanni data set. And the carbon to chlorophyll ratio here does not explain um, this phenomenon. But if we take a look at the zooplankton, there is an increase in zooplankton that could suggest that there is an efficient transfer of carbon from primary producers to primary consumers. OK, so um, we can correlate the wind stress on the x-axis with a number of these parameters. And I'm showing four of them here. And we see that in the summer, when we have a large negative delta T, Area production is significantly correlated to it, as well as um, the log of entropy ratio. But we have a, a low entropy ratio here. Um, at the same time, also, we find a significant correlation between chlorophyll. So we actually have a decrease in chlorophyll in the summer. 
But if we apply a two-month lag, we see a significant correlation to zooplankton biovolume. So that kind of supports the idea that perhaps we have an efficient transfer of um, carbon to primary consumers. And that's why we don't see the usual type of pattern with chlorophyll increase in an upwelling system. And so uh, to give you a brief glimpse, since what I've been talking about is mostly eight-day average data, so we can't resolve any, anything uh, more frequent than that, I just give, um, am, am including an example of the data that we get from the Cape May Lewis Ferry. We have a monitoring system that we placed in the summer of 2011. And so the Cape May Lewis Ferry goes right between the two capes here. And it's um, useful to look at. Uh, things like tidal changes and changes um, uh, on a shorter time scale. So we have several parameters um, here with time. So this is the ferry going back and forth between the two capes. So it starts, it starts at Cape May and then Lewis, Lewis to Cape May, Cape May to Lewis, and so back and forth throughout the day. So in the black line, I've given as a reference the sea level data from the Brandywine Shoal Station. And so as you can see, there's a change in, in the tides. And I wanted to just point out that the temperature that we see here, um, there is pretty large variation across the mouth. But also, there is a large variation throughout the day. Between So the temperature um, varies between less than 20 degrees to more than 25 degrees over one tidal period. And this is the typical variation of the summer. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that dissolved oxygen saturation here um, is often more than 100%, which suggests that this, um, we can see how this um, region is quite productive. So we can see it from the dissolved oxygen um, data. So to conclude, um, we find that applying favorable longshore wind stress takes place during most of the summer, and it's significantly correlated to the upwelling index. Um, then the water in the upwelling region is at least 2 to 3 degrees colder than the adjacent bay and shelf regions. But as we can see from the ferry data, that temperature change is actually even larger. So the source of the cold water is the cold pole. And this is significant because we have accumulation of nutrients over a seasonal uh, time scale. And so perhaps the persistent delivery of nutrients during that upwelling season helps to sustain high primary production that we see in this region. But we don't see the normal response of high chlorophyll biomass in the upwelling region. And our conclusion from our work was that this is perhaps due to zooplankton, where um, we have the carbon efficiently basically grazed by zooplankton. And so basically, I'm, we're, we were trying to represent a case uh, that's a little bit different than um, typical upwelling systems, where we have um, like a upwelling that's uh, driven by wind stress at lower magnitude. And then we have, because of the regional changes, like um, things like the cold pool feature, um, we have a different type of response. So I think that's it. Thank you. I hope you heard me well. Yes. Thank you, Ioana. That was great. So what we will do now is we will move to the question and answer period for the speaker. And I just wanted to note for everybody that I have two files uh, that have been uploaded in the file sharing pod below. The first is her presentation, and the second is the animation um, that was also part of the presentation. Those have been uploaded. So do we have any questions for our speaker? If you do, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A pod on the right-hand side of your screen. So we'll give it a minute or two for some questions.
surely there must be a question or two for our speaker. <laughs> I know it's the end of the day, although not for any of you on the West Coast. Okay, let's take a look. Great, okay, hold on just one moment here. <clears throat> okay, so Dr. Acker has asked, 2003 was an unusual summer with upwelling favorable winds along the entire U.S. East Coast. Did you notice any differences in 2003? Um, I didn't look particularly for 2003. Um, could I perhaps go back to the slides? Of course. Of course, no problem. So um, from what I've read, um, I actually think that um, this happens. So it's a seasonal phenomenon that I think happens every year. Um, that's the indication uh, that from other studies along the New Jersey shelf, um, studies that have looked at winds and um, uh, the cold pool, uh, pretty much if you put them all together, you see that this is a recurring pattern. Um, if I take a look here at 2003, like for example, you can see that in our region in particular, you can see um, 2008, that's part of the reason why I was concentrating on, on this one, was, was pretty significant. Um, but you can see, um, I think there is, um, um, so if you if you do uh, filter on the wind, right, to to get rid of some of the small scale variations, and then the filter on the on the delta t, you can definitely have um, a uh, cross correlation. So you you can get a lag. In fact, we actually calculated lag. So even though we look at eight day average data, we, you can still see a response. So I definitely think there's a, a response. On a particular year, you could have, for example, colder winter. That would cause for the cold pool to be um, colder. And you may see a larger difference depending on how warm the, the summer is. So your delta T could be higher. So I would have to say you can examine individual years compared to other years based on these factors. We just did mostly um, a time series analysis to be able to get at whether this happens um, every summer. And it does. And I bet you if you look at older data, um, you will see the same. But it was really nice to be able to get some of the, the Giovanni um, data sets that really helped to um, solidify this. OK, great. Thank you, Ioana. The next question is, have you had a chance to look at the effect on fish catch or fish recruitment off the coast? No, but this is a very good question. Um, I think that this is the next step. Um, I would say um, there has to be maybe some, uh, if, if we see a response in the zooplankton, I would um, say that there probably is maybe a response in the in the fish population as well. We can certainly see, I mean, just from observations, um, we have a lot of dolphins in the region, and we know that um, this region is fairly productive. We can see that from the from the chlorophyll, but well, not from the chlorophyll. But um, I I think that this could maintain uh, maybe not in a a food web on a big scale, but it's certainly worth looking into whether we can see this um, increase in zooplankton and whether it's transferred to other trophic levels. Um, I would also say perhaps we could look at, because I only um, used as a, we only used as a zooplankton um, um, proxy the zooplankton biovolume. So I would say zooplankton species could also be looked at. That would be that would be an interesting thing to look at. Okay, thank you, Ioana. So the next question is, uh, can you explain more about what is going on with the carbon? 
carbon. Um, could you uh, follow up on that? Would you like me to look into the particular carbon or? Um, so Dan, carbon? can you clarify that question a little bit for our speaker? If let me see, are you still online here? Uh, So basically, um, what we looked at as a as a proxy for biomass, and that would be primary production, right? Um, we looked at chlorophyll. And um, by the way, there is, for example, a paper by Xu et al. in um, that targets the New Jersey shelf, and I. I just uh, noticed actually um, the other day that they also saw the same type of pattern where we where they had very low chlorophyll in the summer. So chlorophyll suggests that there's not a, a high biomass, at least in, in surface waters. It could be that the biomass is, is at bottom and we can't see it. However, um, I think uh, from the historical data set that we saw, we also um, had chlorophyll samples that were taken in situ. And also from the, I don't know if you can see here, but the ferry measured chlorophyll. And it's very low. So in this region, just where it passes, the chlorophyll in itself is very low compared to you know, the adjacent bay, for example. So we know that there's not much going on there. And then the one thing that I had mentioned is carbon to chlorophyll ratio. And this is particulate carbon that was taken from the historical data set that we just did with chlorophyll, so just the ratio. And we couldn't see any changes that would interpret the low chlorophyll. So we think that because of this, we think that chlorophyll is actually, or phytoplankton is actually being grazed on um, since we still have a very productive system. And by the way, the production is based on carbon-13 and carbon-14 measurements. OK, thank you, Ioana. So the next uh, question is, um, was, so the, it's more so of a comment uh, and a question at the same time. There was no study done to prove that the abundance of zooplankton is really increasing, right? And then he adds uh, abundance slash biomass. So um, there wasn't any in situ study done on chlorophyll. In fact, uh, this is something that I've talked to Jonathan Cohen, who is now at the University of Delaware, and I think they will try to do some studies on chlorophyll. This is just um, data that has that is available on, let me just take a look here. Um, to say this correctly, the National Marine Fisheries Survey Copepod database. So you can go online and you can extract the data. And these are samples that were taken on a number of cruises along the uh, Mid-Atlantic Bight and other regions. So we just focused on the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And the zooplankton. Um, we didn't do any growth studies or um, any studies to see, um, uh, you know, the actual what kind of species of zooplankton there were. But we just used available data for zooplankton biomass, so they could be any type of zooplankton. I can tell you that in the Delaware Bay, um, the primary species I believe is Acacia tonsa, and I can tell you in our samples that we've taken, not for this study but for other studies, we often see little zooplankton in there. So um, it, there have been more historical studies done, and I think there is an increase in the summer in the Delaware Bay of zooplankton as well. But for our purposes, we did not do any toes or um, anything that could confirm uh, the historical data that I'm presenting. OK, thank you for your response. And so I believe you've already just answered this, um, although I'm not going to attempt to restate the species of zooplankton you just mentioned. But Jim Acker asked, what are dominant bay zooplankton, copepods? Yes. 
uh, the it's the Acacia tonsa is a dominant one, and I don't know if I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly as well, but it's the dominant species in the Delaware Bay, and in the summer in particular. Um, on the shelf, I know that changes, and I can't tell you exactly the spe the the name of the species, but I can I can look it up and I can follow up on that. Okay, that sounds great. So, Jim, I guess uh, I'll put the two of you can be in contact um, separately offline. Are there any further questions for our speaker? And uh, and there, one of the participants is uh, saying thank you for the presentation, full of graphs, where you could actually see the relation. Uh, any further questions for our speaker? Let's see. Oh, okay. So Jim said, I saw an online article indicating University of Delaware is doing zooplankton survey of the bay for the first time in 60 years. Yes. So um, there have been a lot of zooplankton studies done earlier in the in the 60s from when the school was actually found. And uh, now that we have actually someone who is working again on zooplankton, I was very excited about this. Um, they're doing um, a number of studies on characterizing the zooplankton variability in the Delaware Bay. So um, this will be this will be very cool, and I'm hoping that they're also focused on this um, this relationship between the appalling as well. And uh, so I know that they're mostly interested in characterizing it in the Delaware Bay, so that they would do a uh, comparison between the historical data set and and present times. But I think then afterwards, they would also um, extend this into the aquelling region uh, and the shelf. OK, thank you. All right. Any additional questions for our speaker? I'll give it just another um, 30 seconds or so, at which point we will uh, adjourn for today. And uh, we will continue with our third day of presentations tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'll give it just another minute or so to determine whether or not there